coming back. Um, so we hope you had some time to really consider and reflect on everything we've been chatting about these last three days. Um, the first thing we want to ask, what we like to do at every 1RB World meeting is to end with um, some thoughts about our goals. To, we, we've identified a lot of challenges, a lot of um, gray areas, and um, we, we want to move forward in a constructive way to fill in some of these gaps we've identified. And the question we want to ask you, each and every one of you, is what do you think you personally can contribute to advancing some aspect of retinoblastoma, management, care, research, survivorship, something that resonated with you that you think you can contribute for our collective good? <laughs> this killed discussion. Yeah. <laughs> It's very easy to think about what someone else can do, right? But what can we do personally? Um, Cleonia. Like I, I have a whole list. Okay. <laughs> and part of these, I guess, are um, areas where I see my expertise lying and where I have a keen interest. Um, so I have down a mom, dad, buddy group, perhaps, partnering parents with an adult survivor for questions, perspective taking, things along that line. Um, helping to expand resources and or referrals for ocularists and surgeons. Um, increasing psychosocial support for adult survivors. I think a very common theme that I heard, and it's Brenda Ray's, I don't see Brenda, but she talked about um, how the research didn't necessarily seem to bear out what we are seeing and or what we talked about during the course of these days together. In the groups that I was in and just talking to folks, there seems to be a common theme of PTSD as well as suicidal ideation at certain points. Um, so trying to expand that area. Increasing public awareness I think is huge. I was diagnosed 50 years ago and to hear that the same roadblocks that my parents stumbled into in trying to get me diagnosed and treated are the same roadblocks that are occurring today I just think is unconscionable. Um, and putting together, in addition to this world conference, because I just feel so emotionally full right now from being here with all of you and from the information that I've gained. So in addition to this conference, an annual or biannual meeting where it might be territorial based, I don't know, North America, South America, the Americas, Africa, wherever, but <laughs> just so that we can come together more often. Um, and maybe you also have some family focus, strictly family focused um, opportunities where we can come together. Okay, I'm gonna shut up. No, those are great. Um, any responses to that? Or, yes. Uh, sir. Microphones coming around. Thank you, Cleonia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I was mentioned earlier about. Uh, I, gave her a shout out <laughs> I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, um, and just to piggyback on to that comment, um, I'm from Arizona. Uh, a parent of a bilateral five-year-old daughter. And we have an organization which I'm finding out may be the only organization in the United States for families. It's called RBAZ. And we get together quarterly with families, uh, RB families in the state of Arizona, and do family picnics, do camps, do a day um, at a water park or whatever. Of course, that takes funding, which is tough because there's so many other organizations out there asking for funding. So that's probably one of our biggest um, issues there. But with that being said, there's a lot of families that are hurting to find connections with other people and survivors. And I just want to say thank you to all the survivors here that have shared your stories 
because that gives me hope for my little one. Um, and thank you for the doctors for giving insight and sharing, uh, allowing us parents just to be in your world, in your minds, picking your brain. Um, but there are a lot of families out there hurting for connection um, and information. And I don't know, I feel very empowered. <laughs> I don't know what this is going to look like later, but I've already been talking to uh, Lori Padilla in Arizona, um, working with our group, uh, possibly expanding something. There has to, there's, we have to be able to do something. Um, but I do feel like there needs to be more education for brand new parents and laying out all of the options, every option, even those options that could be you know, not great side effects or whatnot, but the options have to be laid out, and I don't know if the medical community is doing the best job giving us all of those options. It literally takes just one parent having to advocate for their child, and I had to hop on the internet. I wasn't told all of these things. My, I had to fly across the United States to find the best option that I felt was good for my daughter, and, um, we just want to be supported with our decisions. And um, so, so, thanks. Great. So am I hearing that it's a retinoblastoma uh, survivor parent buddy system, regionally based? Um, maybe you two can lead? Anybody else interested in uh, participating? I see hands. OK, I, I, great. I, I, great. <laughs> I'm thinking that I, we could participate, but I'm wondering if we could even go off Brenda's thing and have it connected to this. So. This is very sound with all the medical experts in the world, so it's all in one spot, so nobody has to go to all the different sites. Yep. And maybe the parents do some sort of, you know, like a white paper or what it means for different tumor size, or just so we understand. Okay. You know, like in lay terms, or I mean, we're getting better at it, but just so, or, and maybe even organize like once a month, like WebEx or something, if you want to talk about different things, or you know, um, maybe somebody could ch show you know, what it's like to go under anesthesia so they understand, the, you know, what happens. Uh, just a support group, but have it linked to this so it's ethical. And it's, well, not ethical, but it's just a, that it's a, everybody's on the yeah, same page. Yeah. So, so having it linked to, so Depict is a clinical database, which is not yet live, um, but working towards linking the, the patient group through that, sure, or, or this meeting, and right. we see hope, yeah. But I think the One RB World site um, is a good place, and that's a place where um, you know all of these groups could be could listed. Could be listed. The, sure. The We See Hope site also has a lot of really wonderful. You know, I encourage everyone who's at this meeting not only to go to it, but to share it with people who are not at this meeting. What the treatments mean, um, a lay description of them, what the different tumor staging means. It is on there. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Thanks, Sandra, for running. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what you were saying. When Brian Ma was giving his presentation, I was sitting at my spot and I was making all these little notes and I photographed every slide and I could just visualise my consultants, which I, I love dearly. I've worked with them for a very, very long time and I think they do a great job. Um, presenting a very objective view of all the treatment options for each child. But I could see a flip book, and it was almost like Brian's slides that would, they would use, that they could say, okay, there's this treatment, and we would use it for this, and there's this treatment, we'd use it for that. And then we'd show them the photos and say, now, do you see what these images look like? That's why we would suggest this treatment for this eye and this treatment for that eye. And you know, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't all have to keep making resources. But, you know, I was hoping to get catch Brian to say, you know, hey, I really love what you had and I'd love to turn it into something. But it could be something that one RB world can create. And then we can all just download it and print it and turn it into a laminated book and, and a little pamphlet that you then give the parents and say, okay, we've just told you your child's got eye cancer and they've got this and we're going to treat it like that. And it's gone, not even in the ear, it's gone over your head because you're just struggling with the fact that your child's actually quite sick, even though they're well. 
you can go home and there's all that information we just showed you and you can read it and try and process it. And I hate the thought of parents Googling. And that's the first thing I say to them. I say, look, do not, do not go on the internet. Do not go now, just stay off it. If you wanna look at anything, go to We See Hope, go to the Checked website, go to CHLA. This is where I want you to go because you, you will regret it. And they listen to me, so that's really good. Great. So that's my suggestion. So but you're suggesting co-creation of a patient resource to link staging and treatment yeah. in a way that yeah. parents understand? For the clinicians to use. For the clinicians to For use. For us so to not a... use with the parents in okay. a language that they understand, because okay. what Brian had up there was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So a, a clinician based. So, okay. Uh, all right. So Sandra, are you going to be in um, charge of that? Okay, could we also um, create a patient-directed one or something that one, the buddy systems could use? You know, a, a, a survivor who really is expert on RB could use it with a new family too? Mm -hmm. Just so we don't rely on unreliable clinicians, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> it should be what the clinicians use Oh, should okay. be in the language, we don't need two. Okay. We need one, and what we're giving to the parents should be in the language that they can read and understand. Okay, and all right. Not, not medical terminology. And to, to, follow, <clears throat> to follow up one of the items that uh, you know, We See Hope and the board have been talking about what next to focus mm -hmm. on, has been something along the lines of patient support packages whereby you do gather the information for specific issues all in one place and distill it in, in, in the way we've just been discussing. Okay, so as a researcher, I have a question. How would we know this is working effectively? We have the tool. One great thing is that we're co-creating it with the patients, so they're telling us it's working. Okay. Uh, how would we know that the, this resource actually does its job? that patients are understanding. Okay, so people have, can you use the, sorry, the, yep. So you would know it was working and that it had penetration mm -hmm. if the family said, yes, that's how it was explained to me mm -hmm. and I still have my copy and they put tick marks or X's or pictures of my child to show me what applied here. Okay, so it was used uh, and maybe some feedback that they th that felt it was effective? Yeah. Yeah, and then maybe reused again so, th okay. so that it's theirs, it's gone to them, and you want to ask the families. But you'd really like to know that the clinicians are actually using it, and that means they need to get... So we're training clinicians to use it too. Yeah. Okay. And I, th I think the child project. life specialist too, and you could maybe, I just think of those after the EUAs, you would fill out those surveys. Okay. So like that, but if you did like a survey monkey and then it was just easy like right. for outcome questions so you could have outcomes. And I just, I just really want to caution everybody that at, from a parent, each case is so different. Mm -hmm. like it's just, you do the best that you can. And I mean, there was such a, we had such a great group when we were going through, but I was always comparing. And I just want to caution everybody that each case is so different and that everybody just does the best they can and just got to treat each case individually. Okay, so we're having... clinicians do that as well. Yeah, and I think it from parents, each, I would, but I was always... Yeah. And, and that, I, I'm really directing it at the parents because I was just always, well, did that work for you? Did that work for you? So that from a parent thing, just everybody just... And you can't feel... You do the best you can at the time and you can't have any guilt, you're doing the best for your kid. Saving their life is number one. Okay, so, so far we're talking about patient linkages, co-creation of a material that will be tested somehow for effectiveness, led by Sandra, okay. Yep. And, and don't forget about the angel parents because we're honestly desperate to help you. We, it's how we, are, we carry our, our child's story and, and it lives on and we have a lot of experience because for our child to die of retinoblastoma, we've been through all of it. We've been through the intraarterial chemo usually. We've been through a nucleation. We've been through systemic chemo. We've been through stem cell transplant. We've been through clinical trials. We've been through it all. We are, it is how, seriously, it's how it gets me day to day is talking to the moms 
I put a lot out there on the retinal best on my mom's group. Um, I love it. I love telling his story, and I love helping you, and it makes me feel like I still have a purpose because my purpose when he was here was to get him better, and I don't have that purpose anymore. So my purpose now is to help you with your children, and I really I want that. I want that opportunity, and I know it's not just me. I know Jenny Garrett's mom is desperate to help, and Paula's parents want to help in Spain, and, and I know Isabella is desperate to reach out and, and help in, in Texas. and. You know, we're, we are here and we do have a lot of knowledge and experience and we, we do want to help you guys. So please, you know, use us when you see us on these groups as well. You know, reach out to me on Facebook. I'm, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> you can either get Damien's page. I'm the one that runs that. You can Facebook me directly, whatever. But we are, we're here to, to, to be a source of knowledge for you guys and, and not pass judgment. And I swear I won't. I, I don't love some of the treatments, but I, I will not pass judgment on your decisions as a parent. I'm just here to support you and, and love you and your children. Great. So Sarah, um, we're connecting you then to Cleonia and RB Arizona for maybe a collaborative effort. Is that what Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I would be honored. Great. Uh, anything from online, Thomas? Uh, no? I'm covering most of it. Okay, good. I've been on the same page. That's good. All right, microphone over here. Okay, sorry. Um, Sandra totally had the same idea. Um, but when my, this is loud. Um, when my big kids got their braces, they had to sit and watch this video about like how to brush their teeth, right? Um, but I had a similar thought to her as far as just basic education for parents at the time of diagnosis, just kind of giving a um, like an overview and a big picture, like Dr. Mar's presentation. But I was also talking with Dr. Barry um, that first night about how, you know, we have clinicians and we have like the oncologist and the ophthalmologist and we have social services but the psychological picture seems to be lacking now i know in some facilities um child life i i hear will serve that purpose but if there were that component in our facilities where we were offering that support even at the time of diagnosis do you understand what you're hearing do you have any questions this um kind of People who are trained and have that intuition and the bedside manner to walk a person through their journey from start to finish would be something that I would love to see. I'd actually love to do it because okay. I wish I had that. And to walk with somebody through their journey would be a privilege. Great. So maybe this is something that can, it's sort of along the same themes. I think it's fantastic. That's great. Agreed. Um, yes. My turn? Okay. Um, I, uh, I have a lot of things I want to say, but I feel like as a parent, if I had been given that handout from Dr. Marr, I would have been terrified. I would have no idea what any of that was. I mean, I was scared enough about the fact that my child had cancer that I don't think I could, I could deal with the pictures and the treatment options and having to like pick one, like I'm at the ice cream shop. So I, I think... I think that what's happened in the United States right now is that we've shifted a value to sight instead of life. And that's what I'm hearing on, on RB Moms a lot, and that there are doctors performing IAC who have no idea what they're doing in small centers around the United States. Um, I would be willing to try to get some of that information anecdotally from our group, maybe, to go forward as who's being treated where with what and what sort of, um, I mean, these are like unilateral cases of kids and they're having three years of, two, three years of treatment. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Remember, we, we've gone through so many components of retinoblastoma and as we're hearing, each case is different, right? Yeah. From the staging, right? From everybody's gonna respond to this new information we're getting from what's the molecular component of each. So it's really hard to pass judgment on centers. Um, we want to be respectful too, at the same time, making sure we're getting quality care for every patient. But what you're saying is, is good. You just gave a different perspective of maybe not wanting all that information. Um, we also have to be, you know, we're also thinking retrospectively. What we think we would have wanted at the time of diagnosis right. is this educational resource, but maybe that's bias from where we're looking back. Maybe at the time you actually wouldn't have. Um, I think we can sort this out though, and maybe our next meeting or the next meeting is a working meeting where we try out all these combinations and say this works, this might not, and come up with a resource that could be used for even 
different patients and survivors who might want a lot of information or maybe don't, right? Y you know the, best. <laughs> right. The other piece yeah. of it is that with, I, um, I was immediately surprised by the fact that even my own pediatrician, my child's pediatrician didn't know about RB exact. I mean, she didn't diagnose her till, well, at four months she saw the white reflex, but then was like, oh, no big deal. So it's months and, you know, it's several months later till I go to the ophthalmologist. But, um, so I got on this awareness campaign and I tried to reach out to the kids, but in, in Iowa where I am, there's like one child a year. So um, it, I tried to get a group together um, a few times, but there's just not enough people locally. I don't know about Arizona, but um, then the HIPAA laws came into effect, and now they won't even tell me yeah. any of the new kids. It's just I, by chance I'll, I'll see them or they'll find me on Facebook. But So now there's no connection between parents because the doctors can't tell us. Yes. about the new cases. Yeah, our hands are tied in many ways, even sometimes with what we can communicate on social media. Um, that's good perspective. Did I hear um, interest in, in being involved somehow in an awareness campaign if we can figure out a way to connect you, maybe through this other initiative? Anytime, okay, so awareness, linkages, and resources for patients, yep. Thomas, yes. Yeah, so on the <laughs> note of resources, I just wanted to say something from Lori Padilla who from RBAZ, um, she was contemplating moving away from that. She just wants to make it noted that she is committed to staying um, and working with new, new and, um, and survivors as well. So she's a resource. I want to Fantastic. put that out there. Fantastic. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. So let's do these two. Oh, we'll perfect. Go yes. okay. Somebody else? Okay. So as, um, as ocularists, there's, there's a way we can help in um, getting post-enucleation survivors to check back into their programs, mm -hmm. um, if not, if there's not a formal survivorship program, maybe um, we can put together other um, other entities or other places where they can check into um, throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, because from being here, I learned that uh, survivor, uh, you know, following. Uh, their follow-up care is important and so um, I think that we should maybe begin a program to get post-enucleation patients to uh, check into a survivorship program so maybe I can present at the Ocularis Society in 2019 and try to get that awareness out to the other Ocularis because we come into contact with many Fantastic. of these people. Great. I would like to um, also commit to maybe looking into curating uh, survivorship clinics on this map we have, and that way um, we can figure out where to connect patients to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, hi, Melissa. Um, I actually was really feeling passionate about the survivorship clinics and was thinking of putting together a list. So something I could do was to try okay. to put together a list of uh, clinics throughout the country and maybe even also just a list of genetic centers so that mm -hmm. people know a place where they could go that might understand their genetic test results. And so maybe that's one way that I could help by getting a list um, mm -hmm. put together that could be on the We See Hope uh, website. Also, some of us survivors were talking about how a couple years from now might be too long. We have some momentum and we've all gotten together and gotten to know each other. So maybe I can work with a few other survivors and uh, Lindsay's really fired up about Omaha. Um, so we'll see, if <laughs> but we'll try to, maybe we can all keep this going so that we can support each other better. And I know Len had something to say too, super quick. Okay, I will be super quick. Um, I am looking at how in both here in California and beyond I can support both families and survivors with my mix of skills as, as a therapist and also as a survivor and a human. Um, I'm not quite sure what that looks like but part of it I think is connecting in the way that M Melissa was simply just describing that I think as survivors we need to come together and so I'm willing to be part of facilitating that process. I'm not yet sure quite what that looks like at a practical level. I'm not always the best at logistics, 
But um, I feel that there's a strong need for this. We, we need to be talking with one another as well and supporting one another, particularly over a few of the rough spots and also with some younger people who have been over going over the rough spots that some of us have already trod. I think we could be really helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so I think, sure. Yep, live stream. It's, it's, no, it's not actually live stream. It's me. Oh. It's, great. Oh. <laughs> it's the live live stream, exactly. All right. <laughs> so it's really not a question. I just want to implore with, with everything that we do, it is my job to just remind folks to please um, make sure we include accessibility yes. from the information out as well as the information going in because as we know there are a lot of people who need their accessibility and we have a lot of information to both give and get so please uh, include accessibility I appreciate that thank, thank you. you all right well we are nearly completing here but as we look forward to um, our next meeting whether it's in two years or, or sooner with the momentum that we've built here uh, I think we, as the organizing committee, uh, would like to get an idea of what goals you have for the next meeting. We did a lot of education, a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of goal setting for the retinoblastoma community. Um, but are there things that you got out of this meeting that you definitely would like to see again? And there are things that you'd like us to bring to you. Uh, not anything specific, but I would like to definitely see more breakout sessions. I liked the more intimate yes. circle talk with other survivors and families, maybe geared you know, more towards topics of, of that. Um, those were really enjoyable, so maybe more of those. Great. I like those too. It's less pressure than sitting up here. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Thank you, I second what Becky said about more breakout sessions, mm -hmm. or if we can add more breakout sessions, perhaps extending the length of some of the breakout sessions. And what Caitlin and I talked about is perhaps establishing different tracks. So perhaps a parent track, a survivor track, a family track, and then sessions tied to that where we could pick and choose. Okay, that's great. Sandra's making me run today. <laughs> That's a great idea, Cleonia, but I, my concern is if we do tracks, then the clinicians won't hear what the parents and survivors have got to say. And I tell you what, these last five years for me have been transformational, completely transformational. So I know what you're saying, but it, the, meet, the point of this meeting could be lost, and you have to be careful. It, it could be a combination, I think. There's room for both, yeah. yeah. So my, my point is very different. Um, I, I think we have a lot of wonderful fathers here, but we're missing a lot of fathers. Mm -hmm. We do not understand what fathers of new children with cancer need. That's a whole area I would love to see us bring forth with whatever science there is behind it, whatever is there is to help fathers of newly diagnosed children with retinoblastoma. Hi. So if we're going to do tracks, could we do tracks on a topic and mix people rather than do tracks on a group and not hear each other? I'd, I'd be thrilled to have that kind of interactional thing, but if each, each group had a topic, and people could sign up for one or two topics before coming and be a little prepared, then our time here could be most fruitful and we might have an outcome or two at the end. And I'd like one of those topics to be uh, some way to find funding for some of the things because I heard people talk <laughs> about a WebEx group where you can talk to each other. We need to find somebody who's going to donate to help that. And Kids with cancer isn't such a bad cell, and kids with eye cancer and kids without eyes, that's not a bad cell either, but we need to find a way to do that. I think a dad spoke on Monday, and maybe we need to put that together as one of the topics. Thank you. Uh, not to diminish everything we've learned over the last three days, but my favorite panel was the psychosocial outcomes panel. Uh, 
as a parent, you feel awfully alone. And I would like to suggest, though, on uh, if you if that you continue to have that panel, but maybe next time in front of the physicians. Uh, the, we, yesterday we had a lot of physicians here. They need to understand that not only do you have retinal blastoma, but you have a family now that is suffering from depression. I think you can pretty much assume that everyone in the family is going to be impacted by some depression. And I don't mean to be morbid here, but imagine spending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars or more and having a family go through this terrible event for only for the patient to just give up and check out. I think that probably happens. So in, in this uh, panel, I would just suggest if you do it again, which I hope hope you do, to have a parent discuss just how horrible it is to have a child, to have your child go through this, to have a grandchild also go through this. It's just really, really tough. And I think the doctors need to somehow find a way to treat not only the retinoblastoma, but the secondary uh, issues that come along with it. Thank you. So this is just more of a something you I think that was done really well and I hope to see it again in the future is just that um, getting to hear from the doctors and researchers of the things that you are passionate about and the things that you're pursuing and the ways that you're trying to advance retinoblastoma care was not only such an honor, but it was amazing because that gives us parents insight into where we need to push behind you guys and support you. And it was really, really an honor to hear from, I mean, there is such amazing heart and passion and ingenuity in this room. And to be hearing what you guys are doing and the thoughts that you're thinking and the heart behind it was such a privilege. And and I hope that we get that privilege again and again because we want to push forward what you're doing. We want to enable this to move forward and to continue and to make it better for the ones after us. Thank you very much for saying that. I think my, my uh, comment is in line with that as well. In, uh, We've heard a lot of great stories today from every patient over here, and I think uh, that's really what drives us forward in our own practice as well. And now, outside of our practice, I think we're learning from other patients of other practices in a forum mm -hmm. like this, and that's very important for us to grow as doctors and ourselves. Uh, uh, I, I think one thing uh, that doesn't come out quite often from doctors is that it's actually quite an emotional um, situation for us as well. You know, when I had to enucleate uh, an eye of a child who was as old as my child, and this hit me when, after my child was born, I was treating retinoblastoma for a good 10 years before that with no problem. But then I had to enucleate a, a baby who was as old as my baby. And then that sort of struck me that that might be a, you know, a situation here. So, so uh, stories, like that and stories like how um, uh, we had to treat a child who came in from Africa to India for treatment, who'd lived most of his life in India and not in Africa, and how that impacts the family and those sorts of things are stories that we can also tell as doctors. I think sometimes uh, telling those stories is important in a group like this. I think, I don't know, it's just a wild card over here, but throwing out doctor-related stories maybe okay. for the next one? Sure. I think yeah. that should be... I think that's a great idea. It'll yeah. help us understand each other and bond. Yeah. yeah. We I'll were talking about this on the first night, but you know, doctors are not taught in med school um, how to say this hurts me too. I've cried over my patients. I'm sure a lot of people yep. in this room have. I've had sleepless nights thinking, oh my God, I hope they're gonna be okay the next time I see them. 
Um, but in med school, you're actually taught not to say that to parents and not to say, um, not to say I did this and I think it was the right decision, but I don't have a lot of data and, I, and I'm worried about it because, oh God, if it doesn't work out, you're in trouble, right? There's a lawyer in the room. We are taught not to say that. But sometimes it's true. We're doing the absolute best that we think we can do. Um, I think most of us carry your children in our hearts. Um, people who practice retinoblastoma do it because they're passionate about it. And um, I think that's a really good point that this might be a, a forum for us to venture a little bit outside of our medical training into our personal training. So. I have a, uh, another comment around, um, the, so the lady um, mentioned the, the need for financial support. So that is a very, very valid valid point. Um, it took a, a lot, a lot of hard work to identify and reach out to potential sponsors for this event and to even get phone calls and FaceTime and build relationships was extremely difficult. There's a lot of people in this room who have their own networks to help, um, who know the other stakeholders, physicians in particular, the stakeholders, um, manufacturers of equipment, the um, pharmaceutical companies who maybe, um, uh, you, know, you, you know who produces methylon and the um, necessary uh, things that you use to treat the, the patients. Um, one of the things I'm going to be doing to make sure this event is sustainable and can recur going forward is build a, a, a detailed map of the stakeholders who are involved in RB from a kind of commercial sense who may want to get involved and sponsor and support patient advocacy and interaction like this. We, we've we created a very, very unique and novel vehicle here and I think it needs to be ex you know, expanded and sustained um, both financially and then similarly to the extent that you have um, contacts with trade publications and any even internal hospital journals whereby we can, after this event, produce um, an article to feature what happened over the last few days. That would be extremely useful to keep the momentum going. Then two more quick things. Um, one is that um, I was thinking that perhaps uh, next time uh, something with um, mindfulness-based stress reduction. So we had the motivational speaker um, on our Monday, but also I, I, I have done some mindfulness-based uh, meditation and things like that. And since um, this hits all of us, survivors, parents, clinicians, having that's actually learning some tools to help us with coping and I think it might be a really nice thing to have a session led by someone who can teach us some more strategies for that and then there was one other thing that I now I can't remember oh and to reiterate what I said in my talk which was that maybe also having someone who is a clinician who's helping with psychosocial adjustment so maybe we can have um, Len and Marissa and I did the best we could, but um, we'd love to, we're a little emotionally attached to it. So maybe we could have somebody who's actually a clinician to help um, to teach other survivor clinics what to do and um, teach us how to help each other, our children, our parents, everybody who needs help um, adjusting to this difficult diagnosis. Thanks. We got one more comment. Do you want, yes? Hi. <sighs> I just want to say that I really miss my <laughs> European physicians, co-workers, because I, I think I am the only European here. Even Guillermo cannot be here, but um, I think that in the United States, the other meeting, the retinoblastoma meeting is, if it's in Europe, all the Europe people get together. It's in the United States, all the, in the United States, and then maybe we can cross our countries just to get, because I have a lot of parents also, but one, only one of my children's parents um, get here, and the other ones are in Spain. This is one thing, or maybe the, the next one, one retinoblastoma world meeting, we are all together. And the other thing is, I think my patients are 
um, I'm so glad to have the journey because we know them, they are so little, so young, and we stay with them from two months until 21 years old, getting everything, just thinking about every night what I'm doing, I'm doing it right, the chemotherapy, systemic chemotherapy, when to inoculate it, how to get to the parents to know what is the inoculation, what is the risk, what is not the risk, and in between, putting the cells in the rats to do scenograph and trying topotec and melphal and everything, everything else. And when they go to school and to the university, I'm really happy and glad that I have this work I have the journey with my parents and my patients also, always. So thank you very much. I think we have one more here. So do you want to talk about the resources and then I can read you? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, I wanted to piggyback off of Dr. Barry's comment um, about, first of all, I have to say that you physicians are in an incredibly tough position. And we as parents, uh, recognize that. I think that I, I've always lived by a certain mantra that I never make huge decisions when I'm emotional. Um, I know it's nearly impossible to not get emotionally attached to your child and infant patients. Um, and, and I know that's a very fine line to walk. I also think that without having to come out and say it, the parents really rely on your ability to leave your emotions out to a point so you don't mm -hmm. act in ways and take extreme measures or even risks on our, pay, on our, on our children um, that can have obviously negative effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I admire and appreciate everything you guys do and I'm so happy that you have the passion that you do to take care of our children and I, I, don't, I don't admire the position that you're put in when you have to feel like you, you may have to give horrible news to a family member, um, and maybe not the news that you wanted to give or that you predicted that you would have to give. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you. Great, okay, so thank you. That was very uh, excellent feedback that um, wherever our next meeting is, just to follow up on, on uh, the comment, usually we follow where the PSYOP meeting happens, so 1RB World does rotate around the world, depending on whether or not we can find a, a local host to organize, so stay tuned for more details on that. Uh, we also just wanted to remind you um, here and also online of some retinoblastoma resources that might be of, of value. Um, in India, there's the Iksha Foundation focused on retinoblastoma. Um, in the UK, there's obviously World Eye Cancer Hope we know, started from the UK and has US chapters and uh, Canadian and Kenyan affiliates. Um, USC1, you can? Oh, yeah, so, you know, there are multiple Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. There's Know the Glow, um, USC and CHLA has a site right. on Facebook. Um, I know Bill Harbor has an oncology page that puts out a lot of information as well. So um, Facebook's also a good place for you to right. um, get some information. And, and you probably already know the, the family support groups there, RB Moms Tons and Retinoblastoma groups. in Canada. Um, and you guys are all welcome to, to reach out to me on Facebook as well if there's a way that I can help or um, get resources to you. Right, and uh, I'll remind everybody once again, onerbw.org which has the retinoblastoma treatment centers and lists all the treatments available at each of these sites. And if we're missing anything, whether you're a clinician, researcher, survivor, parent, please let us know through the link on the site. And if you have any suggestions on accessibility, um, anything really, just let us know. So Abby, we have a surprise for everyone, but um, I'd like to just read some closing comments that Abby sent. Um, she said, um, please share my gratitude to Marissa, Mark, Thomas, Kristen, and the entire We See Hope team and gathered community for embracing One RB World 2017 and truly bringing this year's conference literally to the world. Following the proceedings online, I've been struck by the fact that even though our world is vast and many of us aren't physically in the same space, we can feel connected through a shared goal of bringing the best care to children, families, and survivors aided by the amazing resources of the internet. 
We may have many disparate skills and ideas and experiences, but our end goal is the same. So as we keep coming together to share and learn from one another and create new collaborative solutions, we will keep moving forward to the best future possible. So thanks to everyone from Abby. Great, thank you, Abby. Excellent, we have uh, a video that we are waiting to upload that came at the 11th hour, but we're really excited about. So while that is uh, getting queued up, I would like to uh, ask you guys for some help because someone on this stage has a birthday. So I would like everybody to say happy birthday, Dr. Barry. Actually, both of us have oh birthdays this week. <laughs> so uh, happy birthday, Dr. Barry, and happy birthday, Dr. Javaris. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like, Mark, let me know when we're ready for the video. Um, I would like to just echo what Abby said and thank uh, all of our board members, Thomas, Mark, Kristen, uh, Terry, and Sarah, Helen, Morgan, and of course, Brenda, and of course, Abby back in Oxford. Uh, I'd really like to thank Jesse for um, putting all these amazing panelists together. And it's been a really emotional but really impactful three days. So I'm just going to keep buying time because I really want to see this video. And to Marissa for all of her hard work. Thank you, Marissa. <laughs> Thank you. And you have like 17 events to run at USC tomorrow? I have nine events. I get home at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and I have nine events the next day. <laughs> so No biggie. If my boss is watching, and I'm tired. <laughs> okay, I promise it'll be worth it, what we're waiting for, even though I haven't seen it yet. Anyone else have any last comments while we're waiting? I want to thank the hotel staff. Oh my gosh, yeah. yes. They've been absolutely amazing. We've never had an empty glass or an empty pitcher of water. I did find an empty box of tissues, though. <laughs> But honestly, every time we've asked for anything, you turn around and you blink and it's here and they've been so amazingly supportive. And I, you know, I just really appreciate that because we've all been through such an emotional roller coaster. Just having them quickly bring us six boxes of tissues is, is really appreciated. So thank you to all of them. So October 2019 in Lyon, France is our next one RB World. So everyone mark the date. What's happening? I think. Well, <laughs> it is now. <laughs> okay, okay. Awesome. It's happening. Huh? I know. Okay, anyone else? Hi, do you want to talk? You don't want to miss the video from what I hear, so. Huh? Yeah. Let's give another shout out to our children's programming room, Morgan and Kim, for taking care of the little ones this week. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Okay. Our video is coming. Ten minutes. Is he saying ten minutes? We should probably let people. Oh, it's going to take six minutes. I think so. We have a video from someone famous who uh, is a good dancer but wasn't good enough this week, apparently. Unfortunately, it came through on, from their cell phone and it's sideways. It's okay. We can all turn our heads. So we can either watch it sideways now or if we wait... 10 minutes. We will watch it 
We will watch it sideways. Uh, is, okay. it, is it ready? May I introduce it? Um, can we roll it sideways? Okay. Did it come? I came out like 10 and 1. I mean, 5 and 1. There's a little anticlimactic up there. It's like live stream, like right here. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Derek Fisher. Hi, Mark, and everyone at We See Hope, and also everyone that is a part of One Reverend Blast on the World. Uh, my name is Derek Fisher, and uh, I just wanted to send some quick thoughts and words of encouragement for all of you that are there in Washington, D.C. this weekend. Uh, I wish I could be there, um, but in lieu of being there, I just wanted to say uh, that it is, it is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this family that we all share in, in terms of Gretna Blastoma and our children, our families, how we've all been impacted by it. Uh, and just want to remind you that our children are stronger than they look and, and stronger than what they can say even at young ages. And so to believe and have faith uh, that you are going to get on the other side of this, that your children are going to respond well to treatment. Uh, you're with great doctors, things are going to work out. Uh, and it is hard to understand that uh, at diagnosis or shortly thereafter. Uh, but now, for me being on the other side of it, I just want to remind you that you will be too. Your, your children are doing great, they will do great. Uh, and we have to all just continue to believe that. So. Any prayers and thoughts that you send our way, we appreciate them, and I thank you for them, and we'll continue to do the same for you. All right, God bless. I think that was a great way to end our meeting, and I'd just like to ask all of you guys to stand up. Thank you so much for being here. This was a labor of love for all of us, and thank you.